Welcome again, everybody, to our um, continuing discussion on abnormal psychology. And today uh, we will be talking about yet another um, really interesting arena, the uh, issue of substance abuse and the different diagnoses related to substance abuse um, problems. So without further delay, let's get here and proceed. Alrighty, so we will be looking at substance related and addictive disorders. Alrighty, uh, we will look at um, some of the major categories and then some of the subcategories of uh, substance abuse, uh, what was formerly referred to as substance abuse um, disorders. Okay, and then we'll talk a little bit about the etiology as well as um, the uh, common treatments for substance abuse. Okay. First of all, let's, um, with the substance related and addictive disorders, there are two major categories. Yeah, we'll first look at um, substance induced, then substance use disorders. Yeah, formerly known as substance abuse disorders. Uh, substance induced disorders generally refer to a mental disorder concerning um, a situation where a person is frequently being intoxicated. Yeah. So when uh, someone's in frequently, like, you know, um, every other day, they are just um, intoxicated by way of alcohol or some other substance. Yeah. They're just, they're just frequent episodes of intoxication. You can diagnose them as suffering from a substance induced disorder. Okay. Specifying these, but particular substance like alcohol induced disorder and so on. All righty. Substance use disorders refer um, to the patterns, it's clearly related, um, but here um, you're diagnosing someone based on patterns of maladaptive use of psychoactive substances that lead to significant levels of impairment in functioning or, or personal distress. Yeah, so starting to affect their, um, you know, um, socialized occupational functioning. Whereas in the former, we're looking at multiple episodes, which, you know, invariably is probably going to affect things like occupation and uh, social uh, occup um, and social functioning. But the latter substance use disorders is fo focused more on the maladaptive use. Yeah, so what patterns of behavior um, to get the drug, to use the drug is starting to impinge uh, upon their uh, social and occupational functioning. So first let's uh, just uh, look uh, at substance induced disorders. Again, it's a pattern of repeated episodes of intoxication. Yeah. Uh, so when someone is frequently, repeatedly in a state of drunkenness or high or being high, uh, so and you would use the and you would specify when diagnosing the person, you would specify the substance uh, that's inducing um, these episodes. Yeah. So you would say, for example, op opioid intoxication or alcohol intoxication. And you don't have so much nicotine intoxication, um, but you know, common ones are the ones that I just mentioned. Okay. Uh, duration to the symptoms, uh, to symptom onset, uh, basically what we're talking about here is how soon does the episode occur? And it typically, occur, you know, there's not even indication of weeks or months. It's just here because obviously we're talking about a fairly short onset following the use of um, the substance, right? Uh, you need to differentiate it against um, other physical disorders, medical disorder, other medical disorders, um, and um, other uh, medical as well as mental disorders. Now, this is also characterized by withdrawal syndrome, okay? Now, you all are probably well familiar what withdrawal symptoms are. Any of you um, uh, who enjoy coffee, yeah? Um, may drink maybe three to five cups a day. Man, when I was in college, I was up to like eight cups a day. It was really bad. Um, it wasn't like the big, you know, Starbucks cups. It was like, you know, regular mug. But man, I was up to seven or eight cups a day in college. Um, and if I didn't have any coffee, you know, I would have some symptoms. What are some of those symptoms you, you've experienced? You betcha. Things like headaches, being drowsy, uh, maybe even some muscle tension. Yeah, bad stuff, really unpleasant. And the one thing that would be a surefire way of getting rid of those withdrawal symptoms ta-da, consume some coffee, all righty. Uh, so withdrawal syndrome is a cluster of symptoms following a sudden reduction or cessation 
of the use of some psychoactive substance. And yeah, when we're talking about a psychoactive, I know it sounds kind of radical, um, you know, but it's all it refers to is any substance that affects our thinking and or mood. Yeah, so that includes certainly illicit, illegal substances like cocaine and crack and so on, but also, excuse me, illicit or legal substances. Yeah, like nicotine and caffeine, uh, caffeine, caffeine, caffeine. <laughs> um, and among the most common substances, psychoactive substances, yeah, um, used way more than the illicit stuff. All righty, caffeine and nicotine. And it's kind of interesting, right, that the legal stuff, right, like nicotine, right, has a, now it's granted it's decreased significantly, but has accounted for way more deaths than the illicit stuff. Yeah. Now, some, there are clearly some dangerous illicit drugs like angel dust and, um, you know, crack and cocaine used in excess. Yeah. But in terms of mortality, you want something that really kills you? Smoking. Yeah. And, you know, the paradox, uh, the the irony is that that's the one that's been legal and still legal after all these years. Alcohol too, big killer, yeah, compared to crack or cocaine, all righty. Now, the big competitor though is heroin, all right, in opioid-based uh, substances. Now, they've actually accounted, and especially sadly recently, in tens of thousands, I think upwards of 30,000 um, plus deaths in the last few, uh, per year in the last few years. Yeah, so it's a you know, it's um, in terms of overdosing, um, overdosing on um, opioid, um, you know, products. So, um, so withdrawal symptoms. It's also characterized by tolerance. Yeah, and tolerance, as you're probably well familiar, re refers to that state in which the individual requires a greater dosage or amount of the substance to get the same effect, get the same high. Yeah, you know, one of the clearest examples is like with beer drinking. Yeah, when you were, um, well, I won't say how old you were when you had your first beer, but let's just say it was high school, right? All it took was maybe one can to give you quite the buzz. Um, but then soon after, right, one can just wouldn't do the trick. Uh, it would maybe take more, two to three cans, and for some people, much more. Um, and people vary, right, in terms of, um, their tolerance levels and how quickly their tolerance levels increase. Uh, for some individuals, um, and interesting enough, not only individuals, but for um, some ethnic groups, particularly Asians, yeah, and particularly um, among Japanese. Yeah, when it comes to alcohol tolerance, uh, Japanese and other Asians as well, as well, there's just been a lot of documentation, <laughs> a lot of documentation among Japanese because Japanese also do enjoy um, consuming the alcohol. But unlike other ethnic racial groups, the tolerance levels in Japanese folks at, in general, yeah, I mean, there's obviously always exceptions whenever you talk about group data. But in general, uh, the tolerance for Japanese people are very low and it's usually not subject, subject to change. Yeah. In other words, it doesn't take all that much alcohol for a Japanese uh, person or many other uh, Asian folks to uh, get intoxicated. Yeah, and the tolerance levels, even when they do increase, they do not increase to the same levels as non-Asians or non-Japanese people. Yeah. Now, why is that the case? Yeah, well, it seems as though uh, what a lot of the research seems to show it has to do with the production of bile in the kidneys. Yeah, and that the bile in um, Asian, some Asian groups and Japanese just does not process the alcohol quite as effectively, um, you know, as with uh, non-Asians. Yeah, um, so um, Asians uh, and Japanese get really affected by the alcohol at lower, way lower dosages and tolerance doesn't increase, okay? I think that's how it is. I think it's the bile does not process it as well. Um, and so that's what, and now here's the interesting thing is that um, even though tolerance is low and doesn't increase much uh, for Japanese when it comes to alcohol consumption, oddly enough, that's probably one of the reasons why alcohol um, use disorders um, and, it, and uh, alcohol induced disorders um, aren't that high among Japanese people, yeah, compared to other ethnic racial groups, because it appears that one of the things that fosters uh, uh, substance induced or subject, substance subject, substance use disorders is an increasing tolerance. Yeah, so the more likely your tolerance increases and the higher it can, it can increase, the greater the risk for having a substance use induced or use disorder. 
Yeah, but if you kind of plots out real quick, it's harder um, to start abusing that substance, right? Because it, it just hits you so hard so quickly. So if there's any kind of a small blessing um, for some Asian groups and Japanese people is that it's harder, not that there aren't people um, from Asian backgrounds who have um, alcohol abuse, um, alcohol use, um, alcohol abuse problems, yeah, and maybe diagnosable as suffering from an alcohol induced or use disorder. It's just the, the, the prevalence is much lower. Yeah, and again, because of the tolerance, not because of moral constraints um, and social mores, um, but it really in large part comes down to biology, okay? Now, substance use disorders, okay, this is the other category. It sounds a lot like the former category, but just keep in mind the former category refers to a, a pattern of repeated episodes of intoxication due to a substance or substances. Here, you may have that as well, right? Number of episodes, but it's particularly focused on the maladaptive behavioral patterns related to the drug use to get the drug, um, to get access to the drug and using the drug such that it's affecting social occupational functioning. Yeah. Um, in order to be diagnosable, you got to demonstrate two or more symptoms over a year. Symptoms include, yeah, just like as we did, discussed before, substance induced disorders, tolerance or uh, withdrawal syndrome. Yeah. But here, yeah, here are some of the behavioral patterns problems in cutting back or controlling use, okay. an excessive amount of time and effort in seeking and accessing the substance, yeah. and also multiple um, or pattern of using the substance that poses a risk to safety, yeah? Um, so this would be the person who's drinking and driving, yeah, over and over again. Um, also with uh, substance use disorders, you can also qualify um, the person's severity by describing it as mild, moderate, or severe. Okay. You wanna differentiate it from some of these, um, from other disorders, medical disorders, um, almost you want to be sure it's not any almost any other kind of mental disorder such as a depression arising from if the, the primary thing is a depression or schizophrenia or what have you okay um and to separate uh, episodes there has to be about at least a two or more months of no symptoms yeah something in between you know uh, episodes or periods of um these symptoms there has to at least be two or more uh, months where you see an absence of symptoms in order to describe your substance use disorders as um, with distinct episodes. Alrighty, one thing that's important to kind of clear up and it's, it's certainly room for confusion. So here is my attempt to try to cut through uh, some, of the, some of the possible confusion. Um, are, it concerns the issue of non-chemical forms of addiction. Now the DSM has included a category for um, some uh, has included room for non-chemical forms of addiction. Okay, they include gambling disorder, kleptomania, yeah, compulsive stealing, and pyromania, compulsive fire setting. All righty. Now for gambling disorder, it's actually in this category that we're talking about of substance-related and addictive um, disorders. So it's in this category that we're currently uh, discussing in the same category as nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, opioids, and so on, okay? But kleptomania and pyromania are separate, all righty? They are in, you know, I guess maybe if you, if you remember that the terms mania, it, it's apart from uh, the substance-related categories. It's in what's referred to as the impulse control category of the DSM, okay? And um, so, you know, it's important for us to have gone through that to clarify, you know, what's in the uh, substance abuse category and what's not, right? The manias are not, klepto and pyromania. Um, but it is interesting to look at these. You have these non-chemical um, addictive, uh, addictive addictions, yeah? Uh, and it can lead also to a consideration of whether other things in the general, which are considered, you know, are tossed around as addictions in the general public, really are addictions, like the uh, alleged sex addiction, right? 
It's not being addicted to love. That was a very good, good song. I thought it was a good song back in the 80s. Yeah, it's talking about sex addiction. Can actual sexual behavior, could one be addicted to it? Yeah, does having a disorder like gambling disorder open the door for having things like sex addiction and sex addiction groups and sex addicts and so on? All righty. Uh, as you can tell by the tenor of my voice, my presentation, I'm not a big subscriber to the idea that there are sex addictions, but you know, it is subject to debate. Some professionals uh, recognize it as such. Um, I'm just not one of them. Um, but you know, gambling disorder though, arguably does open the door for that. Yeah, that's it. And um, I, I think it's, it's um, gambling disorder. Yeah, um, has enough of a history and pattern and also negative consequences, which you know, justify it's being considered a diagnosis, a non-chemical um, addiction, okay? That said, you know, it's pretty clear to me though that it does, by having it as a disorder, a mental disorder, it is kind of a slippery slope for allowing other things like sex, sexual behavior to be considered an addiction. Yeah, and you can also, but, um, you can also be, you know, uh, think about kleptomania, pyromania. Yeah, to what extent are these, um, you know, illegal behaviors, yeah, um, actual addictions? Well, they're not addictions, right? Because they're in a separate category, but they're they're these behaviors that people just can't stop themselves, right? So they're in the impulse control category. All righty, they are not addictions. Okay, in, in that they're not in that category of substance related and addictive uh, mental disorders. All righty. Let's clarify some terms, yeah? Um, that's obviously related to this discussion. Now, in terms of addiction, how is addiction operationalized, yeah? For purposes of the DSM. Um, well, it refers to impaired control over the use of a chemical substance accompanied by physiological dependence, all righty? So impaired control over the use of a chemical substance accompanied by physiological dependence. Yeah, this is clearly a definition that doesn't apply so directly to gambling behavior, but gambling behavior is in the category, um, whether you like it or not, or whether I like it or not. Uh, but this is what uh, is a general definition, operationalized definition of addiction. Yeah, so impairment of control due to a substance uh, accompanied by physiological dependence. All righty, um, outside of the DSM addiction has been defined in a number of ways. And very often people apply psychological dependence to addiction, okay? Which is, um, which makes talking about addiction very uh, complicated at times yeah, and confusing. Um, and when going through the research, you know, you, you should be very clear on how um, researchers are defining yeah, an addiction. Uh, and that's why uh, the DSM-5 diagnosis are real go nice go-to operational definition. Yeah, it allows for a greater degree of um, comparability in the research. Uh, an important thing also to distinguish physiological versus psychological dependence. Yeah, so when you're talking physiological, you're talking about a condition which the drug user's body comes to depend on a steady supply of the substance. Alrighty, so here what's certainly um, implicated is tolerance and withdrawal, okay, TW, that's how I always think about physiological dependence, yeah, those two um, constructs in particular are at play, yeah, tolerance and withdrawal, okay, psychological dependence, which you can have, right, with DSM related disorders, refers to the compulsive use of a substance to meet a psychological need. And clearly, uh, that has a role with uh, substance with mental disorders. Yeah, um, they, um, you know, very often, uh, sub, you know, you have what's referred to as dual diagno diagnoses. Or when you hear the term dual diagnoses, generally people are referring to the idea that someone is suffering from a substance um, mental disorder in this category and another DSM. Um, mental disorder like uh, major depression or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, yeah, more likely than not, you run into dual diagnosis cases. Yeah, rarely do you have just a substance abuse um, or induced diagnosis alone without another DSM mental disorder. And it works the other way around. If you first are presented um, something like 
panic disorder or schizophrenia, no big surprise. Um, very often you run into someone also using substances you know, to treat themselves, to kind of medicate themselves. Yeah, very common. Um, the other thing you'll also um, observe, and I'm not too sure if there's a lot of great research on this. I think there's some. Um, you often find a relation. There, there, there's no small coincidence uh, between um, the type of mental, non-substance mental disorder that someone may suffer from, or just emotion that someone may suffer from, and the particular substance that someone uses. Yeah. So in other words, uh, what are some examples of uh, people who feel like they're out of control, right? That um, their mind is just running everywhere and they, they just, um, uh, in particular, with negative thoughts about themselves, the world, or the future, um, may use uh, sedatives, right? Uh, things to slow them down, all righty, um, like alcohol to slow down their brain. Now, you know, it's funny, you should throw an alcohol, I should throw an alcohol uh, it, with sedating oneself because it's certainly that's ultimately its um, effect. Um, but, it's, but it is kind of interesting too because um, alcohol seems to also lead to the production of a lot of um, elevated mood and behavior. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah, that's kind of the paradox um, with um, uh, alcohol. Yeah, it's a sedative, but it also seems to be associated with elevated mood and energizing and, and uh, stimulating behaviors, arousing behaviors too. Now, uh, another example would be um, someone who um, is depressed, yeah, and wanting to feel, wanting to increase the arousal, yeah. So they may use a stimulant, yeah, uh, like crack cocaine and so on. All righty, you know. In other words. Situate, you know, uh, you'll very often see situations uh, where people are trying to medicate themselves. Yeah, so whatever the mood is, very often the substance use is to um, take them away from that mood, right? Treat that mood or find, you know, um, offset that mood. Okay, the general effects of drugs. Um, first of all, um, when it comes to um, mental disorders and the effectiveness of treatments. There are effective um, treatments for substances. Yeah, usually some combination of uh, medications, uh, rehab and or a cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, yeah, the most commonly used. Okay. That said, um, among the mental disorders, it has substance abuse, um, substance related mental disorders tend to have the highest relapse. In other words, people having symptoms soon after. Yeah. And usually um, the kind of pattern of um, treatment that you see is someone going through treatment multiple times. Yeah, um, because relapse um, of symptoms is fairly common. Nearly 80% usually uh, relapse after the first course of treatment. All righty. Um, now, in terms of how drugs affect us, just very generally, um, it works through the circulatory system um, and whatever substance we consume works through the blood supply to the brain. Um, and the effectiveness of a drug, yeah, ha is related to its lipid or fat solubility, okay, and its ability to pass the blood brain barrier. And so and not all drugs are created equal in terms of its lipid fat solubility and its uh, ability to, um, buy, to pass through the blood brain barrier. Okay. And essentially, as a general matter, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to make this um, a revisit of um, biopsychology yeah, or pharmacology, but uh, in, in, in some right, substances, either licit or illicit, you know, affect neurotransmitters. Yeah, in terms of their production or um, um, the receptor sites for different and or the receptor sites for different neurotransmitters. Alrighty then, um, what I'd like to do next is to talk about some of the uh, categories. There are three, you can think of drugs um, as falling under three categories. Yeah, um, depressants, stimulants, and hallucinogens. We're going to talk about each category and some of the um, drugs that you'll commonly run into um, personally, uh, <laughs> but um, hopefully more so professionally, uh, as you're not professionally like, um, being a drug dealer, but uh, professionally meaning as a mental health practitioner and treating people. But with that, let me just pause for a moment. 
Okay, folks, uh, speaking of addictions, just had to take a little uh, Red Bull break. And with that little disclosure, let us continue. All righty. So in, let's talk about our first category, depressants. Okay. Um, so uh, among the substances that fall into depressants, as we just spoke about, is alcohol. Now, in terms of the short-term effects, you know, I don't have to go through these um, effects. I think you're probably well familiar with them. Uh, people like to drink a little alcohol. Uh, it relaxes them, makes them feel more comfortable. Um, it's a little confidence juice too, right? We feel more likely to walk over uh, the bar, uh, across the bar and ask someone for their phone number. Um, and sometimes, but the funny thing with alcohol, right? Um, is that it produces all kinds of different emotional behavioral responses. In higher doses, people get really, uh, it, re it really de decreases inhibition um, and people start, um, uh, it starts stimulating a lot of behaviors, right? People might be dancing um, or, right? Sometimes it's a happy substance. Sometimes it ain't so happy a substance. Yeah, sometimes it makes people full of piss and vinegar and they get aggressive and ornery and threatening. Um, and that's why, you know, fights are so common outside of bars. That's why I'm, you know, I'm going to sound like an old fogey. I've never been a big fan of bars, e even as, um, you know, back in the day in college, uh, because the odds, I never ran into so many fights as I did or do uh, whenever I go to bars. You know, it doesn't happen at the shopping mall, at the bookstore, you know, or church and temple, you know, or at the university or hospital, but uh, bars, you know, yeah, you can almost lay down money sometimes, the likelihood of running into a, you know, a fight starting, okay? Uh, with increasing doses, people can be incredibly depressed, right? Start breaking down in tears. Um, and we also know it has a lot of um, effects on sensory motor functioning, yeah? It becomes, it becomes really dangerous uh, when people wanna drive. Um, now, a controversy with um, alcohol treatment is whether um, problem drinkers, people who are diagnosed with suffering from a substance induced or a, a use disorder, whether they can ever drink. Yeah, whether abstinence is the objective. All right, that is the objective in AA. Yeah, if you're an alcoholic, you do not drink ever, ever again, or you try your best never, ever to drink. All right. Um, and whereas, or, or is the optimum treatment objective control drinking? And there's certainly good CBT research to show that that can be really effective. All right. Um, but there are many uh, people who suffer from alcohol uh, intoxication, in induced in, alcohol induced intoxication, or alcohol abuse who just swear to abstinence. Yeah. But it becomes very tricky. Yeah? To what extent is it actually factually the only way that they can um, uh, deal with the problem, or is it that they believe? Right. And, you know, no, it's no, it, there's no small amount of power to belief and the, you know, power of what you, um, what you um, might adopt in terms of uh, uh, assertion as to how things should be handled. Yeah. So if you have the belief that you cannot drink, yeah, well, then you're probably going to operate that way too. All righty. So um, there is a controversy among those who suffer from alcohol use as well as, um, in the, per, in the profession, although among psychologists, um, you know, I don't know if there's a good survey as to how many psychologists adhere to the abstinence versus the control drinking, but there is a lot of empirical support for control drinking and its effectiveness. We'll skip barbiturates regarding opioids, okay? And this is the big, um, you know, uh, substance problem in the United States today. Yeah, leading to tens and thousands of deaths every year. Yeah, it, um, it's kind of the, uh, as crack was back in the, uh, what was it, 90s, eight, late 80s, 90s, and so on. Yeah, and crack was the big feared drug. Well, you know, with reason. Um, now it's opioids. Yeah, uh, so the focus is now on opioids and with reason, you know. Um, but um, I don't believe crack although it can lead to death, has led to the same, has not led to the same death rates as we're seeing with uh, opioids, 
All righty. Um, in terms of short term use, the, the attraction of heroin is that it makes people feel good. It knocks them out. I mean, some will describe it as a whole body orgasm. I mean, gee, I, hard to imagine, <laughs> hard to think of a better sales pitch than that, um, producing a really powerful sense of well being and calmness. Um, usually, in people, no big surprise, who have a lot of unhappiness um, and emptiness. Um, lack of a better term, emptiness, psychological emptiness in their lives. Uh, so this is a very powerful drug in terms of its emotional consequence, uh, emotional effects. Yeah. Uh, in terms of long-term use, there's few medical complications or toxic effects from long-term use, but the problem, where do, where do, do all the uh, deaths come from? Um, overdose. Yeah. And maybe in part because there, you don't have the medical complications with long-term effects, yeah, uh, so other kinds of medical problems along the way that might kind of scare you, uh, put the fear of God in you, do I dare say. Um, but um, it, 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 you can overdose clearly, and it does have a high mortality rate, okay? Uh, and tolerance is very easy to increase, to tolerance is very quick with heroin and opioid um, substances, yeah? Um, what's an equivalent? Um, nicotine. <laughs> it doesn't take that long to need way more cigarettes. Yeah, um, you start off, start off with a few and very soon it's very easy to get up to a pack a day. And if you don't control yourself, very easy to, or tempting, incredibly tempting to have more than a pack a day. Uh, same thing with heroin. Yeah, very powerful, very quick uh, tolerance uh, curve. The withdrawal effects are super powerful too, right? Anything that gets you that happy is gonna, when you're taken away, gonna really make you feel lousy. Also, there's problems with sleep, restless sleep, irritability, loss of appetite, uh, insomnia, muscle weakness, sometimes pain, um, and also depression, which is horrible for someone who may have been partial to depression in the first place, okay? Um, I think a couple years ago, um, licit or legal opioids, typically by way of pain uh, medications, yeah, uh, like Oxycont Oxycontin, you know. Um, the, um, actually, in terms of amount of use, actually outnumbered illicit drug use. Yeah, so illicit drugs, like nicotine and alcohol, right? I mean, illegal use in that people were using it beyond the use of what um, the, the physician or pharmacist um, prescribed, yeah, so illegal use, but not Ill legal drug, but illegal use. So legal drug, um, oddly enough, outnumbered um, in terms of the amount of um, use and fatalities than the uh, illicit stuff. Um, let's look at the other category, okay, stimulants. All right, very popular amongst us to varying degrees in different parts of the country. And that's the other thing that is kind of interesting is if you find, I'm not gonna get into it here um, because I haven't prepared for it, um, but there is sometimes interesting data in different countries and in different parts of a certain, within certain countries of um, the use of different substances. Yeah, um, and so um, and, and it kind of, suggest things going on in different countries or going on in different parts of the country in terms of what people kind of feel like they need to do emotionally to medicate or treat themselves. In terms of stimulants, um, among the types include amphetamine, methamphetamine, yeah, um, and it's street variants, crank, ice, and so on. Uh, Hawaii uh, still has a huge ice problem, yeah, um, and it is particularly high. Uh, the rates in Hawaii uh, Hawaii is among the top states with uh, ice use, yeah. Um, interesting enough, also Hawaii has a slightly higher, you know, disproportionately higher Asian um, representation, yeah. And interesting enough, I think um, in other parts of mainland Asia and Japan, uh, stimulants tend to be more popular than depressants, yeah. So things um, that arouse, that get people up and running seems to be more popular in places like Japan and uh, other parts of Asia, as opposed to things that will slow them down. Not that 
the presence of alcohol isn't a problem, but comparatively speaking. You know, ecstasy is another stimulant, right? Um, makes people feel good, arouses. It actually has a lot of number of effects. Um, some positive effects too. It tends to make people very, um, very huggy, you know, very, um, you know, uh, wanting to make connections with people, very um, empathetic, you know, um, and what is it? Gee, time goes by so quickly. But about 15, 20 years ago, ecstasy was legal. You know, it was used at dance parties and raves quite frequently, uh, but about, you know, 10, 15 years ago, made it illegal, all right? As, as was the case with many substances, right? And even alcohol for a short time was made illegal. <laughs> that didn't last very long. Okay, cocaine and nicotine, huge stimulant, yeah? And a deadly one in terms of uh, cancer, lung cancer. Talk, we just spoke about ecstasy. In terms of cocaine and crack, the effects tend to be fairly short term, um, maybe a few hours, several hours at best. Um, but they are known to produce a high amount of stimulation, euphoria, uh, enhanced alertness. Yeah. Um, now, the interesting thing with cocaine is cocaine actually demonstrates a fewer withdrawal effects than many other substances. Yeah, uh, so that's where you will see actually more instances where people use cocaine for a certain period of time, but then can just stop. Yeah, they might use it for two or three years and then just stop. Um, that's not to say that cocaine doesn't lead to other substances um, and then people use cocaine for, don't use cocaine. I mean, certainly people have used cocaine for long periods of time, but among the substances in terms of withdrawal effects are not, not as potent, yeah. Um, but very powerful psychological effects in terms of uh, making people feel grand, having uh, elevated mood, uh, leading people to have grandiose notions of what they can do, borderline delusional of what they can do, increasing self-esteem. So very powerful in that respect. Okay, nicotine, right? Chronic use of nicotine does not result um, uh, of nicotine does not result in impairment of mental functioning, um, but certainly as a stimulant, long-term effects uh, may, uh, you, you can develop tolerance and it has powerful carcinogenic effects, yeah? Smokers very often will describe this very interesting kind of phenomenon where um, the smoking does, and it does, nicotine does chemically raise alertness, yeah? I remember in law school, a number of friends who smoked very often between class and I was just surrounded by the smoke, you know, and they would do it because, you know, they could study to two in the morning and with the coffee too, um, the coffee would help keep them awake, but they particularly felt that the nicotine made them sharp. They could read and kind of remember stuff, you know, but you always gotta be concerned with that state dependent learning, you know, um, but that, that's what, that was their experience while they were reading, you know, case law. Um, <clears throat> So it helped with attention, concentration, and stuff like that. Yeah, but certainly um, it has powerful withdrawal effects, right? Just like co um, coffee, that when people stop smoking, um, you know, they may have headaches, they may feel drowsy, which is really a lousy experience. Um, and very another um, very consistent withdrawal effect is increase in appetite and weight gain. Yeah, so those who are trying to smoke so commonly, uh, you when you if you see friends trying to stop smoking, uh, very more often than not, you see some weight gain and they're having to struggle with that. So on top of uh, dealing with the um, physiological effects of with physiological withdrawal effects, you know they're also bumming out because they're gaining weight, so they have to even put more effort to exercise and and eat right too. Alrighty, the third category of substances are hallucinogens. Alrighty, the number of um, substances that fall in this category, including LSD, uh, fencyclidine, yeah, probably the more, the, um, the real dangerous um, uh, type of hallucinogen. Yeah, it's a kind of, um, uh, it's the use of angel dust or PCP fencyclidine has been associated with really violent, aggressive behavior. Um, it's that kind of Hulk, like from the comic book, Hulk medication um, substance that just gives people enormous, you know, it just uh, 
arouses them and you know brings about you know whatever their physical capabilities are um, to its fruition, uh, such that you know you frequently hear cases where uh, police it takes several police officers to restrain someone who's on angel dust. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they taser them just because they just physically can't hold the person down. It's dangerous for the officers, you know. Um, but um, and also under angel dust, people have demonstrated um, really dangerous self injurious behaviors. Yeah. So for example, there are no small number of cases where people are hallucinating that there's bugs under their skin or their face isn't their face, and they try to tear at their skin or tear at their face. Um, some awful, horrible night, you know, stories about things like that happening. So they don't just hallucinate, but they act on their hallucinations. All righty. Um, and marijuana too falls under this category, nowhere near uh, as dangerous as angel dust. Yeah, we'll talk about marijuana. We'll talk a little more about marijuana in a moment. Uh, Short-term effects, sensory perceptions, visual, tactile, auditory. Yeah, also mushrooms fall under hallucinogens. Yeah, but when it comes to LSD, marijuana, and mushrooms, yeah, in terms of tolerance and withdrawal, minimal tolerance withdrawal effects. Yeah, physiological, psychological, there may be. Yeah, in terms of the LSD, marijuana, or mushrooms taking care of some psychological needs. Yeah, but in terms of physiological, not so much so. And even psychological, not so much so, but there can be, there can be. Yeah, in terms of wanting, uh, because very frequently with hallucinogens, the effect also, it's, it's a positive effect, feeling connected with uh, um, universal, um, you know, having a sense of a universal connectedness, spiritual, very often um, a sense of spiritual awakening or connectedness, very positive experiences. And uh, sometimes people don't want to lose that experience. So you can have kind of an emotional, psychological kind of dependence on it. But even that, you know, um, in terms of problematic dependence, not so much so, yeah. Uh, but probably it's kind of goes hand in hand with the minimal to minimal tolerance and withdrawal uh, effects. All righty. Although um, LSD can be associated with uh, flashbacks. Yeah, so inadvertent, um, uh, you know, reoccurrence of visual, typically visual, but could be visual um, distortions, yeah, long after the initial use of the uh, LSD. Okay, we talked about PCP. Now, regarding marijuana, yeah, the short term effects are increased well being, perceptual and sensory changes, usually mild. You're not talking about uh, blatant uh, visual, auditory hallucinations. Um, it can impact a short term memory, yeah, negatively affect that, make it a little more difficult to learn stuff when you're high on uh, marijuana. Long term effects, um, there are, there is some evidence for. Um, possible long-term cognitive effects with attention, concentration, and so on. Yeah, um, and again, you can have a psychological dependence. Yeah, and also you can also have physical impact on the lungs as well, okay? Especially for those who like to deeply inhale and keep the smoke uh, in their lungs, that's not great for the lungs as well, all righty? Now, as far as you all are well aware, uh, many states, there are several states now that have made mal have decriminalized marijuana and or uh, made it just plain the commercial recreational use legal as well. Um, but that's not this and you know we very well may have federal law that decriminalizes it uh, somewhere in the near future. You know, I'm certainly a proponent of legalizing marijuana. I think the uh, benefits outweigh the costs. Um, we won't get into a whole debate about why uh, pot should be legalized. Maybe we can discuss that when we meet face to face. Yeah. That said, you know, as a healthcare practitioner, you know, it's not, it's also not true to say that there aren't health, uh, health costs. Yeah. As the ones I, that I just mentioned. Alrighty. So with the legalization of mar marijuana, be rest assured there will be um, a healthcare costs yeah, related to the problems that I just mentioned. Alrighty. It's not going to be, it's not, there are no health uh, consequences. What's there, there certainly are. Yeah, um, but overall, you know, in terms of the potential treatment benefits or psychological benefits, yeah, um, or just recreational benefits, it's probably offset uh, by the uh, negative 
um, healthcare costs. Yeah, but there will be healthcare costs. Um, all righty, but you have that with legal stuff already, like alcohol and smoking. And I don't think anyone's gonna make those illegal anytime soon. In fact, I would submit greater healthcare, far greater healthcare costs with alcohol and smoking. Sorry, drinkers and smokers. I mean, yeah, I, I enjoy drink occasionally. I'm not a big drinker. Um, so for those of you who are big drinkers, hey, uh, that's maybe my bias. I'll be quite transparent about it. And I'm not a smoker, you know, um, not against it, but really not healthy for you. Okay, um, in terms of the etiology, the causative factors for substance uh, disorders, um, let's get into that, but let me just take a little a breather here. Okay, everyone, thanks again for your patience. And with that, let us proceed with uh, talking about the etiology or causative factors. Um, most of the substances, yeah, um, have, um, there's empirical support for a genetic component, yeah, for um, alcohol use um, and a number of other substances, yeah. Um, there's, there are clear family studies which support how substances um, run through families. Twin um, adoption studies have shown that as well. Uh, particularly with alcohol, there's a lot of research on that with monozygotic twins telling tending to be, um, you know, um, more likely uh, that identical twins are more, if one has a substance problem, the other one is also probably going to be comorbid with uh, alcohol, I'm sorry, with alcohol use as opposed to dizygotic twins, okay? Um, and, you know, it's just maybe some uh, people are predisposed to require more alcohol to, ex to experience the same subject effects than others, yeah? Yeah. Um, so that may be part of biologically what's going on with the people who develop alcohol use. Yeah, the, the higher your tolerance, the more you need, um, it's gonna, it increases the risk that you will uh, have some kind of uh, substance induced or use disorder. Okay. Um, now, uh, stimulants affect increasing central nervous system arousal. We have activation of the reward system. We have powerful uh, system. Um, which affects the nucleus accumbens. Um, with hallucinogens, yeah, things like LSD usually um, affect um, an imbalance with dopamine, all righty, leading to the greater production of dopamine or um, greater receptor um, sensitivity um, to uh, dopamine. Yeah, and marijuana um, has uh, effects primarily through uh, the tetrahydrocannabinol. Yeah, uh, which is absorbed by um, by all the tissues. Um, there are also psychological uh, parameters at play. Yeah, with many of the substances. Yeah, as we just went over some of the short as well as long term effects. Yeah, using a substance produces is is positively rewarding. Yeah, uh, with the production of um, you know a pleasant feeling, a feeling of increased self esteem confidence or or if someone wants to feel less right uh, with a depressant yeah feeling negative feelings less so less intensely and so on so use of substances are powerfully re reinforced by some of those reactions yeah there's also powerful negative reinforcement yeah so if we're really feeling sad um we want to feel numb to that sadness yeah things like alcohol can take us away from those feelings, yes, those negative feelings. And when alcohol removes a negative um, stimulus like depression temporarily, right? That's a powerful negative reinforcer, all righty? And so you can have um, positive reinforcement and or negative reinforcement occurring at the same time through different channels, yeah? Um, and there's also powerful classical conditioning at work too. Yeah, so certain um, desired states, yeah, positive um, or otherwise, yeah, to be lethargic, to be calm, for a, uh, increased arousal, attention, and so on, um, positive mood, yeah, all of those very powerful um, effects uh, can be classically conditioned 
to um, different stimuli associated with each substance. Yeah, for crack, it may be the, um, uh, the crack pipe. For marijuana, it may be marijuana paraphernalia. Yeah? And for alcohol, it may be for bottles or bars and so on. Yeah, uh, and especially when you think alcohol, right? If someone with increased confidence uh, experience greater success, right? They meet people, they, they're feeling more confident to approach people at bars and they get, they're successful in getting phone numbers. That's, um, you know, the bar, the bottles, the smelting alcohol can be, you know, powerful condition stimuli, stimuli for that particular mood state. Yeah. Um, so just moving along here. In terms of the treatment, yeah, um, treatment usually involves some combination of biological and or uh, psychological treatments. Yeah, for some it may involve uh, the necessity for detoxification. Yeah, so uh, removing the substance and then the person being in a hospital or a rehab center where they can experience the uh, withdrawal effects, but under medical observation. Yeah, um, so that there aren't any kind of medical complications or um, problems such as cardiac arrest and so on. All righty. Um, some treatments include the use of um, a, a, a medication such as antabuse. Yeah, antabuse. The way it works is that the person takes the medication prior to possible alcohol consumption. And in the event of alcohol consumption, the alcohol uh, now, uh, as it mixes with the antabuse in the individual causes, causes nausea, all righty. It can be effective for some, not a very popular treatment and very infrequently used. Um, antidepressants are very common to, uh, in order to treat the underlying emotional condition for which the um, substance, illicit or otherwise, um, which is being abused, is being used to treat um, instead of, um, you know, medically monitored uh, antidepressant. Okay. With heroin, um, one of the ways of treating it is uh, by way of an oral synthetic version of it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a variant which produces a similar high without the same negative uh, side effects. And the uh, synthetic opiate is methadone. So methadone treatment is very popular. Um, you know, um, it blocks the effects of heroin while producing still somewhat of a, a, a state of relaxation uh, for, for the individual, but nowhere near as power, powerful as heroin. Yeah. Um, in terms of the effects of methadone, um, it can be effective for some, um, but the kind of concern with methadone treatment is whether it really gets at the underlying, it, methadone treatment alone, whether it gets at the underlying issues that led to the heroin use in the first place. Yeah, so methadone treatment can be effective, but probably has to be done in conjunction with psychological treatment to understand the underlying issues, emotional issues, as well as behavioral patterns that led to the heroin use in the first place. Uh, psychological treatments in general, um, and this goes for a, very, a, a number of different substances. Um, so let's, what are some general characteristics of psychological interventions? Yeah. Well, one, um, certainly psychological interventions uh, may want, uh, very often we'll get to the underlying issues, yeah, emotional issues that uh, may be contributing to the substance use. Yeah, uh, you, uh, getting at interpersonal conflicts and problems, yeah, maybe marital, familial, and otherwise. All righty. Um, and helping the person resolve that in a more, you know, um, um, and finding um, other behavioral um, means of resolving those feelings, yeah, as opposed to the substance of other behavioral means is by use is by perhaps being um, is by way of assertiveness training, yeah. Uh, so if someone's depressed because they're alone, they feel lonely, instead of relying on alcohol to deaden those feelings, yeah, helping the person uh, with assertiveness training, social skills training, uh, so that they can get the positive reinforcement of human interaction as opposed to uh, just relying on the alcohol, perhaps, by example, to um, sedate those feelings. Um, behavior modification also involves including alternate behaviors in place of substances to deal with negative emotions and affect. Yeah, so alternate behaviors may include exercise, meditation, 
uh, deep muscle relaxation, and so on. Now, a very common um, way of handling uh, substances is by what's referred to as self-control training. Okay, uh, this is a cognitive behavioral model, very commonly used in of substance treatment, and it, it involves understanding um, the substance use along a uh, ABC model: A standing for antecedent, B for the abusive behaviors, and C the consequences. Yeah. So for the A. Part of the treatment is understanding uh, the antecedents or cues for using a substance. Yeah, so cues may be, um, uh, and this can be very difficult. Uh, certain, the, well, let me take a step back. The not so difficult stuff is getting rid of things that are stimulus cues for substance use. Yeah, certainly the crack pipe, the uh, for marijuana, the, the um, if that's the focus of treatment, um, you know, the marijuana paraphernalia, um, if it's drinking, getting rid of stimulus cues like maybe the obvious one, um, the uh, bottles of alcohol or, you know, um, you know, the sh shot glasses or the uh, mugs of beer and so on, just getting rid of those things. Yeah, because if those stimuli are there, you know, pursuant to classical conditioning model, it is more likely that the person is going to be induced to uh, perform behaviors that's associated uh, with that condition stimulus. Yeah. Um, and here's another antecedent um, kind of stimulus cue or circumstance. It's not just a cue, but it's also um, a complex uh, behavioral pattern uh, that one may need to change and very often needs to change in substance treatment. And that is one's friends and family. Yeah, If friends and family, and particularly a spouse, is using a substance and the individual, the client or patient, wants to get off the substance, they have to either get rid of the friends, not see those family members, not necessarily, well, family, it's not forever, but you gotta be able to find another way to see them. Yeah, and it's very tricky if you have a spouse who isn't changing their drug use. Yeah, um, that becomes extremely tricky in terms of finding a way to relate with the spouse in a way that um, it just doesn't lead, it doesn't lead to um, a relapse. Yeah. And the odds are if the uh, spouse isn't getting treatment and they're using it, the odds are super high and very likely that the patient is just going to use it again. Yeah. Um, but when you can change friends, you change friends. Yeah. Family, you can't change, but maybe you have to find different ways of relating with them. Yeah. So if the whole family, um, you know, there are a number of alcoholics who are just not going to change their behavior and they always do it at Thanksgiving dinner. Well, have Thanksgiving brunch with them <laughs> uh, in an open public place, yeah, where alcohol isn't served, something like that. I know it sounds silly, but that's what you got to do in many instances, yeah, uh, to varying degrees depending on the individual, but it's, it's that important. Yeah, if you want to decrease the likelihood of their using again. Um, regarding the abusive behaviors themselves, uh, it just goes to the point of finding alternate behaviors. And there are a number of alternate behaviors, uh, healthy behaviors that one can use to uh, reduce negative affect. Yeah, and it is tough. Yeah, well, it's first of all, just as an aside, tough to learn meditation. It's tough to learn exercise, yeah, and increase that. Um, but those can be incredibly effective in decreasing negative affect, emotions and affect. Yeah, are they nearly as powerful as some of the substances? Do they work as quickly and as intensely? In most cases, no. Yeah, and that's what makes treatment difficult. Yeah, but that's not to say there aren't these healthy, effective alternatives. Yeah, which many people can uh, incorporate and develop as part of their kind of behavioral repertoire when they're feeling down. Yeah, um, and then also examining the consequences of use. Yeah. So when they um, use a substance, are they being positively reinforced? Again, friends and family and others. Um, um, and and are, they being are they being sufficiently punished? You know, are there negative events? Yeah. Um, and maybe there are those around them who... Um, um, oh, the term's escaping me now. Um, but, you know, there are situations where friends or family... Um, kind of make it easy for someone to use substances. Yeah, um, they may actually, you know, by providing, you know, a lot of, um, now there is a place to provide support and love 
when someone is going through substance treatment. Yeah, but sometimes people inadvertently use that support, direct that support and love in a way that it becomes actually inadvertently a positive reinforcer for using the substance, right? Someone uses a substance, they feel lousy, and then, you know, they get a lot of love and support um, um, from friends and family, which may inadvertently be a positive reinforcer to use that substance again. Yeah, um, whereas that same love and support can be directed differently to increase healthy behaviors. Okay, not to say, you know, you shouldn't give love and support. It's how you're giving that love and support. All righty. And with that, that's all I have to say about uh, substance, um, the types of substance uh, problems, its etiology, some of the treatments, uh, biological, but I think we spent uh, obviously more time on the psychological for some obvious reasons. And uh, with that, um, thank you for your for the privilege of your attention again, and I will see you in our next Abnormal Psych chapter. Take care. Bye-bye.